talk about a project I've just finished up doing um, over the last uh, year or so, um, which is to interface stuff to SAP, which is a, a legendary ERP system. ERP just stands for Enterprise Resource Planning, which is a way of saying it's a fancy accounting system that takes over your entire business and makes itself completely indispensable to you by organizing everything. Um, SAP itself is a, a very document-oriented ERP. It's all about purchase orders and delivery orders and sales orders and all of those documents and how they flow through a, a business and so on. It's very good at doing that. It has a, a GUI that is very configurable. You can add uh, features very easily. You can adapt it to your own business processes very easily. It's very, very flexible. However, it is also a little bit obscure. Um, we should have had a competition to name the icon, I think, from that little strip of icons. Um, there are things there that I don't quite know what they're meant to be. Um, it has its own whole programming environment, which is completely alien to every other programming environment that has existed anywhere ever. Many of the internal names are in German or abbreviations in German. So you have Werks and Means and that's material class <laughs> and so on and so forth. So you get used to having to interpret and all the identifiers are five letters long and in capital letters because that's how you fit them into a 30-bit identifier and so on and so forth. There are a lot of legacy things in this from, because SAP departed from the mainstream of programming a long, long time ago. Um, from a certain point of view, uh, for us ground living mammals, it seems very alien and weird, uh, but it's actually just a different kind of system. It's very well adapted to its native environment and the crossing pressure and permanent darkness of the enterprise development environment. So <laughs> look, from our point of view, it's a bit like a leviathan that we have to deal with, but um, don't really know that much about. Thankfully, it actually interfaces quite well to the rest of the world. It, there's a thing called NetWeaver, which is their interface system. It's got several different protocols you can talk to SAP with. And these are actually reasonably open. They're reasonably well defined. There are libraries that talk to them. SAP supports open source projects like PyRFC that's mentioned there, and so on and so forth. I'll be mostly talking about the OData interface. I don't know if anyone's heard of OData before. It's a, it's a kind of a RESTful, an implementation of REST that um, has a few exciting features of its own and deals with things like nested queries and all that sort of stuff. The downside is that the code that you develop all of this stuff up is actually stored inside SAP as database entities. Now, anyone who programmed for, say, Zope knows how much fun that can be. If you are trying to embed your own code into your own database, you get this problem of handling revision control and all of that sort of stuff. OData is an interesting one. It is basically RESTful. It does serialization in JSON and XML. It does, thankfully, actions as well as just CRUD things. So you can basically say, oh, I really don't feel that this fits well into REST at all. I'm just going to make up an action and use that instead. It lets you do nested serialization, which is handy. It means you can grab whole documents at a time instead of having to grab little bits of documents and then their children and their children and their children. And the best bit about it, though, is that the entities that you are dealing with in OData don't actually have to correspond to SAP's entities. You've got some freedom there to, to make up your own decisions. Because it's, it's a RESTful interface, it's very easy to talk to from HTML5 apps. You can just hit those resources and grab stuff as JSON and, and manipulate it and push it back. Why are we interested in HTML5 apps anyway? Aren't they horrible? Um, they are kind of horrible in a lot of ways but they are also very easy to implement. They also are very easy to implement cross-platform, uh, so you can have the same code running on multiple devices. Uh, the particular application I've been working on in this project runs on uh, hands, industrial hand scanner units with a little laser scanner engine in them, and it also runs on industrial PCs, and it also runs on people's desktops, and it's, it's very easy to use the same piece of code running on all of those things. It's actually really useful for training, we found because you can show people what it'll look like on their little scanner on their PC. Um, and there's heaps and heaps of library support. If you decide you want a fancy dashboard, you can just go and grab D3.js. 
um, for charts and exciting animated whatnots and so on and so forth. Speaking of which, user experience. The reason, the other reason we went with HTML5 is that none of the existing sort of libraries for this sort of stuff uh, give you a lot of adaptability in your user experience. Now, this software is being used by people who are driving forklifts in a giant refrigerator at three in the morning. So they have relatively little patience for a suboptimal user experience um, and are not afraid to tell you about it. So um, they're a very busy environment. They're a very time critical environment. Uh, if the project can save you a minute on loading a truck, that's a serious increase in the factory's capacity because it means they can move one more truck in a day. Um, so you really can't sit there and go, no, no, that's not the way the library works. I can't make an extra button that does what you want it to. You have to work out what the user's workflow is and adapt your ways to what they want to do rather than vice versa. And that's a picture of me in the middle of a refrigerated warehouse at three in the morning wearing my programmer's high-vis vest. <laughs> um, but that's what you have to do to, to get the job done. And it's, it's I think, the, one of the big keys to the success of this project has actually been the amount of time that the team spent in that warehouse environment and working directly with people. And um, it was great to get feedback directly from people where they'd say, no, no, I hate new technology. I don't want anything to do with it. I'd rather use a pencil. And then as you go through and you talk to them and you get sort of some, some mental buy-in from people, they go, oh, okay. Well, it's all right, I guess, you know. All right, talking about the architecture of this project. There's lots of different ways to put these parts together, some of which may work better for you than others. Um, the first option is to just give a web server direct access to the underlying database. It's doable because most of these big systems use something like SQL Server or whatever underneath their, their business logic but it's probably not a great idea because it's going underneath their business logic. You can easily get the database into a form which is, is not allowed by business rules at a sort of a higher level of abstraction. Um, also, it's very easy for someone to denial of service your ERP system this way because you're putting requests into a, a web application which is then passing them on to the back end and it's, there is no rate limiting. You could add it, but it's very hard to add rate limiting to that and to avoid people from handing you expensive queries. So one option there is to just synchronize it off to another database and use that. Um, that kind of gives you a layer of insulation and you can imagine you can run a firewall down the middle here and then have this on the, in the DMZ and that on the core network. Um, the sync process between those things can be a bit hairy, but you do have an opportunity to denormalize the data and make access much quicker that way. Um, as a case study, a project that's just wrapped up, um, but ran in production for six or seven years, um, did exactly that. I developed that one for Actrol. Um, they've since been acquired by another company, so that, that has been merged in just a couple of months ago to the acquiring company's thing, but it ran in production for, for several years doing exactly that and dealing with thousands of businesses who were the users of the system every week letting them review invoices and statements and report on gas usage and how much rent they were going to be up for and all of that sort of stuff, and make payments. And I'm, I'm happy to say it moved $31 million worth of payments in that time, which was not bad for a credit card gateway. Um, it eventually got, uh, as of this year, got merged into the acquiring company systems, and it was quite fun watching the, uh, their programmers admire my IE6 compatible HTML5, or HTML, whatever it was back then, uh, templates um, with little no script tags in them in case your JavaScript was turned off because that was the era when it was originally developed. Um, it was kind of nice that it reached the end of its natural life cycle. It was ready for a redesign, but it was a good piece of software while it lasted. All right, so back onto SAP stuff. Um, NetWeaver gives you this interface into the side of the ERP logic, so you can write your web application to talk directly to that. It's kind of nice. It's easy to talk from HTML5 to OData. There are very few moving parts. You've got the, the server you already needed to have, and you're just talking into an interface on that. 
no extra infrastructure needed. The problem is it's not really available while the ERP system is offline and people who assure you that the ERP system is available for 24 hours a day often then forget to mention they didn't mean Sundays or Saturdays or at three in the morning or other things that we would normally imagine were part of 24 hours a day. The other thing is you're stuck with the built-in systems, revision control, authentication methods, all of that sort of stuff, which can be a little inflexible. Um, this is actually the, the architecture used by the project I've just finished. It's running over six farms around the country. It's running uh, 30 scanning devices and about 20 tablet devices and moving about uh, 1,000 pallets of stock a day. This is stock with uh, uh, mushrooms which have a shelf life in the warehouse of about three days. So logistical mistakes are extremely expensive. Um, and this has helped reduce the error rates greatly and it's actually sped up the speed at which we can move stuff around. The application uses local storage and HTML5 manifests as a, a way of working partly offline, but then you bump into the problem of how the authentication system works and that whole system doesn't work that well offline. And the guns can't synchronize to each other while the ERP system isn't there to broker that. So that's a bit annoying. Um, I just said that. And the, the lack of good revision control makes the development process a lot slower. All right, so at least the, the minimum thing I'd recommend for a thing like that is to stick a reverse proxy out the front of that system to give you a little bit of an ability to control more of the details of what your, your communications look like. And at least that way, if the ERP system is unavailable, you can give people a friendly error message rather than just a, the server is not responding. Um, so that's good. Oop, that one's not quite formatted right, but you get the idea. Going from there, you can sort of combine that second one with that one and say, well, let's synchronize data out of the ERP system into an auxiliary database. Um, the sync process is still hairy. You've still got to deal with weird amounts of data, but at least you, you are going through the core ERP logic now. But you've got to now add in a web server and a secondary database and so on and so forth. The good thing is you're online the whole time now. You can run your own database. You can make that a, a high availability database. Um, you've got a lot more flexibility in how to deal with that stuff. As a case study, I spoke to some guys over at the reject shop at the start of, of the project, and they, they are doing basically that architecture using BizTalk, um, SQL Server, WebSphere. Now, there's a name I haven't heard in a while, but nonetheless. Um, they do that basically as a way of being able to uh, develop much quicker at the, at the applications they're developing. They have a fairly stable core of things that they've made available through um, SAP, and then they can write little applications that suit each role rather than writing one big application and having it as a big project. I think that's an excellent way forward for these projects. What I would really like to be looking at for my next round of this kind of descent into madness is to look at things like Couchbase, this distributed um, databases so that you have the, a complete copy of the database at the, the far end, or at least as much as it needs. Um, and asynchronous updates back and forth between those databases. I think that would be an excellent way to do it. And it gets rid of some of the requirement for having another layer of, of complication in there. Uh, that way the HTML5 app could just talk directly to Couchbase, which would then synchronize itself back with some kind of server that does the synchronization. Um, all right, so now we've caught our Leviathan. What do we do with it? Well. The ERP system itself is very hard to change. You don't want to change the core logic of the ERP system at all, if you can possibly help it. These are projects that people spend two, three years on, um, all the way from a, a very waterfall-y specify the problem and get all the stakeholders in a room together, actual physical room, um, discuss endlessly, do lots of planning and testing, and, and it's rolled out very, very cautiously. A, a broken ERP system can bankrupt a company very quickly. Um, especially in this age where people are doing sort of last minute ordering and automatic ordering and stuff. If you manage to break your ERP system, you often can't trade until it comes back um, because you don't actually know what a part costs anymore. So it changes very, very slowly and with an incredible degree of caution. Um, 
the API code that you've embedded in there also has to change fairly slowly. It's extensible, but you really don't want to be fiddling with it a lot um, because you, you have to get it into the core there and a mistake in there could stop the main ERP system from working. It's not as critical because you can generally just switch it off and go and trade on the, the main system, but you still don't want to make a mess of that. But once you've got an API, you can start defining little systems around the periphery that do different tasks and so on and so forth. And you can keep expanding those until you have a whole bunch of little projects around the edge. You're now very free once you've got a consistent and complete API. You're now very free to go, well, I've got two weeks. Fred has a problem. I'm going to do a sprint on that problem and come up with some kind of prototype, hand it to Fred and say, Fred, what do you think? It's a, it's a great way to work. It's, 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 what we call agile, really. And this is something that enterprises do not traditionally do very well because they're too worried about breaking the other thing that they already developed. So it's a way around that problem. So right, we have an API, we've developed that, it took us a long time, but now it's here, we can be very agile about these things. We can come up with a new project and get it out there. All right, I'd just like to thank Mark and Loki and Vobo for their input into all of this stuff as um, I went around talking about architectures and projects and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch or make comments, there's now or there's any number of ways to talk to me over this internet thing, which I hear is catching on. Um, that's about it, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Have no. we got any questions for Nick? About how you talk to um, Strange things under the sea? <laughs> no? Not really. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, just a quick one. How many people are in your team helping you do what you're doing? Is it just you on your own? So, uh, myself, there's a couple of uh, people on the functional side who are all about working out what the business actually needs and what SAP actually does, which is uh, two concepts that are very important and sometimes aligned. Um, and the ABAP side of the stuff was done by Mark, who I thanked in the thing there. Um, and I've done pretty much the HTML5 side of it and a lot of the, the sort of the UX and that side of things. Um, it's the kind of project that I think now that the, the APIs are there, it would make uh, a lot of sense to um, have someone look at the, the design more carefully and to come back and, and review that stuff. It'd be great to have someone who's, who's more of a UX specialist than myself to come back and look at where that could be improved even further. But now the basic APIs are there, that's actually quite easy to do. And it would be quite easy to, to say, right, let's iterate on this and come around and compare it to the old one because that won't break anything. So, yeah. So it's been a, a small project. I guess it's taken me, um, been a, on average about three days a week for about the last year working on this sort of stuff. Um, but uh, that's including rolling out, training people, visiting all those sites, walking them through it, being there at three in the morning to, to be there in case anything goes wrong, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's been a very hands-on job, and that's actually been probably the most fun part of it for me is, is I guess, getting that hands-on with the, with the business and getting to know what people do. It's cool. Alpha on a big scale, yep. and um, uh, what about like is automation? Um, you know, like sensors of their equipment and plants and yep. stock. Is that a totally different kind of thing, or would you see it? It's interesting to get those systems that they're putting together. So or? there's an interface there. Uh, uh, if you think about, most of those things are done by say a, a separate robotics controller, right? So there is in fact a palletizing robot at one of these plants. There's three of them and they, they pick up cartons and assemble them into pallets, and they know what that stock is because they are also labeling those pallets and doing all that sort of stuff. The question is how do you interface that into the core system without putting yourself at risk of getting a lot of garbage in there? And one of the problems that, that tends to come up is if you have an automated system doing something, it can put a thousand pallets into stock due to some kind of bug. Uh, and they're not real stock, and now someone has to find where they are in the database and remove them and all this. 
what we're actually doing is printing barcode labels for all of these things and then scanning the barcodes by hand, which means that there's a human in the loop and that human can provide some sanity checking. So the human actually does some quality control tasks. So the, the pellets coming out of the automated systems get labels on them and then you actually have a look in the pellet and make sure it's what it says it is on the label and that the quantities are correct and all of that. Then you scan that label and that's enough to import the record into the main system. So it's like a QR code that contains the, uh, everything there is to know about that pallet. You can accept that into the system using the scanning gun and then it can be moved into the warehouse proper. So as for alfalfa, I imagine that has some fairly bad sh shelf life constraints as well. So yeah, it's similar. Right yeah, sim similar problem. I mean, the, the, the reason why this is an interesting project in a lot of ways is that short shelf life. You've got to work out which stock to is optimal to send to which location, which is not something I've really talked about in this presentation, but uh, one of the more important things the scanning software does is it looks at it and says, well, no, there's older stock you should be sending. Don't send this stuff um, out now because there's other stuff you could be sending out that would still be in date. Also, don't send this stuff to, say, Queensland because it'll be too old by the time it gets there. So that's a big, big factor. And if you've got lots of customers all around the country, um, you need to consider that kind of stuff. It's not just, um, you know, first in, first out. It's also what's going to get where in time and who who requires what stock and what do we do with it and that sort of stuff. Cool. Thank you. You just reminded me of a tour I did. Nothing to do with software. <laughs> oh, Ten years ago, maybe. Went to BW's distribution place in Warwick yep. in Queensland. Yep. Six kilometres conveyor belt. Yeah. Under yeah. Some of the some of the sites use all that sort of conveyor belt based technology as well, and it's it's amazing to see in, in full tilt. Oh yeah, it's true. We drove up to the building and you know, there's all these stores for packing semis up. There. Yep. I counted them, forty seven. Then when I got inside, they were just an incoming doors, the outcoming yeah. ones on the other side of the building. <laughs> it's a massive. And I guess nowadays it's all using something like this. Yep. yep. Well, it, it, the important bit is not to. If you if you have a system where you drop this stuff down on a, a clipboard, and bearing in mind it's a, a one degree C humid environment, um, you use a pencil because a biro won't work for any length of time. Then you've got some stock control, and that's great. But then someone has to take your slightly damp pieces of paper and enter them into the system later. You've just introduced a probably 20 hour lag into your, your stock control system. So if you're trying to be a bit clever and do uh, you know, on-demand production and all of that sort of stuff, you, you've just made your life a hell of a lot harder. Whereas with a system like this, the, the moment you put that pallet on a truck, that pallet has left the warehouse. The moment you harvest a pallet, it exists in the system and you know it's there. So it's a lot easier to make predictions about what you'll have too much of and what you won't have enough of and so on and so forth. So I think that's, the project itself is, is good because it gives some efficiency to the actual you know, workers on the floor, but the efficiencies it enables in the, the bigger picture are, are even more important in terms of reporting and accuracy and, and ability to do things more flexibly. Yeah, I can imagine the 20-hour delay with a pencil and piece of paper, how much what the error rate would be. That's pretty bad too. Yeah, that can be, I mean, you, you have to be very careful to make sure that you, you know, your handwriting is very distinct. Yes. I have a plan of, of uh, how to identify these problems in companies. You just find every A3 clipboard in, a, in an organisation. If you need a clipboard this big, you have a problem that needs a database to solve it. That's my, my theory. I can remember seeing an A3 timesheet, Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it, it, by the time you get to that scale, if you're handwriting a document that has, you know, cells that big and you, it's expanded out to the number of products and the number of pallets that you, you suddenly need to have a matrix this big to write it on to be handwritten in a legible manner, that, that's a problem. That's, that's, a, that's a symptom of a, a system that you haven't, that needs some work, needs some optimization. One in every six entries 
six records, not entries. Yes. Or something. So there's something wrong with it. So I'm hoping that these systems will improve on that. Yeah. Well, one of the things, actually, just another thing I didn't didn't mention in the presentation, but one of the other things we really learned was uh, um, health checks. So we, we actually do almost a, a checksum process on the whole thing and say, right, well, according to this, we've got this many pallets. How do we physically check that we haven't made any mistakes? And there can be things like pallets live in a location and these locations are, are either big or small and there's a maximum number of pallets you can fit in, say, a shipping container. That's just a hard physical fact. So you can do a health check that says, if it says there are 20 pallets in this shipping container, something is wrong. Go look, you know, and, and this is a really important part of the project as well in the sense that when people are first adopting these systems, they often forget to do things and they, they often lose things and, and muddle things up a little bit. And so in some ways thinking about what the constraints of the system are to say, no, that's just not possible, it can't have happened, so let's go back and rewind and find out what's happened is a really valuable thing to add into a system, I think. Cool. All right, no more questions? All right, thanks for your time. And we have the usual presentation of Armando for you. Thank you very much.